Welcome everyone, Straight From A Scientist podcast here. I'm with Anton Rogachev from Toronto, uh, University of Toronto, sorry, not Toronto University. I don't know if there are two of them, uh, but he works in Dr. Karen Davis's lab at the University of Toronto, and they focus on using brain imaging to understand chronic pain patients and some of the different functional changes that might happen in chronic pain, no, chronic pain patients um, and how um, we might learn from those things. So uh, Anton uses functional MRI, magnetic uh, resonance imaging to study the brain and some of the networks and different brain structures that talk to each other in a chronic pain state versus a normal state. And we're really excited to talk to him today because we also um, had an episode, episode 31, uh, which is more of the molecular side of pain research, which study these networks at a very cellular level. Um, that episode 30 was with Waylon Yu from the Tom Cash Lab at UNC. So go check that out if you want to learn more about that side. But today we're going to be talking about kind of a more zoomed out version, which can be applied to patients and uh, can be applied to really large data sets and really help us understand these things um, from, from a much larger scale. So Anton, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. So what drew you to this kind of research, pain research in general, or was it um, the concept of using brain imaging? What was the inspiration here? Uh, yeah, it was mostly the imaging aspect, to be honest. It was actually in fourth year or in my last year of undergrad, I got to do a thesis project using imaging, not brain imaging, a different kind of imaging, thermal imaging. Um, and it just found it fascinating, um, very applicable to uh, the clinical population. And from there, uh, once I was heading into grad school, I knew I wanted to continue that line of work. But at the same time, I was also in upper years taking really interesting neuroscience and psychology courses. And so meshing those two areas, brain imaging and, the, well, and neuroscience and mm -hmm. psychology, I kind of um, narrowed it down to um, imaging uh, within... Uh, some sort of neurological or psychiatric population. And so then I reached out, I did some research, reached out to a number of labs that I thought would be applicable to my interest. And I was lucky enough to land a position in Dr. Karen Davis's lab. Very cool. So you're kind of, um, I think, you know, these things evolve, right? And, and so you started with something you knew you liked and then you built on top of that. I, li I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you just published a paper. Uh, That's right. Called Abnormal Low Frequency Oscillations Reflect Trait-Like Pain Ratings in Chronic Pain Patients Revealed Through a Machine Learning Approach. Um, quite mm -hmm. a mouthful. <laughs> so we're going to break yeah, that no down doubt. for everyone. Uh, first off, congrats. I know that a lot of work Thank goes Thank you very much. Um, we'll, of course, link this paper in the show notes for everyone interested so you can check it out. Uh, but let's kind of try and digest that all that real quick. So I think this will give people a really good uh, insight or picture of snapshot of your research. So abnormal low frequency oscillations. So we're talking brain waves here, right? Exactly. So we use functional magnetic resonance, resonance imaging or fMRI to extract uh, the activity of the brain. Now, there are two main avenues of uh, fMRI that are typically used. One is called resting state uh, and the other is called task evoke. So my thesis particularly focuses on resting state fMRI, which means that mm. um, the basis here is that you pop the patient or the subject into the scanner and you just ask them to lay there at rest for about 10 minutes. And the idea here is that um, the way your brain is, at, the way your brain works or is connected at rest, translate or sort of taps into the functions during task. So for example, just to give a brief, very theoretical example, um, is if you have, let's say, two brain regions that are involved in, let's say, pain perception. If they are highly connected at rest, the idea there being is that during, during some sort of stimulation, some sort of perception, these two brain regions, because they're so highly connected, will make the, uh, will make the patient or the subject be more sensitive to pain. Does, okay. does, that, does that sort of make sense? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, yeah. kind of drawing on what I was talking about with Waylon, um, if some of these networks are active in a, in a normal state, 
then that could be one of the underlying causes of chronic pain in a sense. So like you might have some networks become active in during acute pain sessions or, or when people are experiencing kind of traumatic experiences or and then if you have this underlying activity, is that pathological or am, am I misinterpreting that? Well, th these networks are always active okay. and some of them work together. Some of them work uh, in or what we like to call are anti-correlated, mm -hmm. um, but it's how they are all integrated and how they all how they're all working uh, may be abnormal in a pathological state such as chronic pain. Okay, and are you looking for perhaps one brain structure that's more active than another, or is it it's purely about the uh, the connections between um, different brain regions in this study? Yeah. So the the way that, or yeah, so the way that the field of brain imaging is trending these days is that it's moving away from a specific brain region and moving more into systems so, or into brain networks mm -hmm. and focusing on how these different brain networks uh, function together or how different regions within a network function together and how that may go uh, awry during uh, pathological states. Okay, very cool. Yeah. So to do this, uh, I know I noticed bold was highlighted a lot in the study. Um, brain oxygen level dependent imaging, right? Um, now, when you're using, bold, yeah, yeah, I guess could you break sorry, that down a little yeah, bit for us? Yeah, yeah, bold oxygen level dependent. So that, so that is the signal that we are we are extracting and using um, to, uh, or is, is the metric that we're using, this, or the signal that we're studying. Mm -hmm. Because fMRI does not actually measure uh, neuronal activity directly, uh, we use this bold signal as a surrogate or as a probe for the what we think is neuronal activity mm -hmm. in the brain. And so the oxygen okay. consumption yeah. of the tissue or the structure. Exactly. So it's based on the blood response. So mm -hmm. the idea here being is that when a brain region is active, it is using more oxygen. Right. Therefore, there's an increase in blood supply to the brain region. And by by measuring that, we can see which brain regions are being active, uh, more active or less active. Very cool. So um, I did also notice that you had some people who are on uh, in this study. You took uh, was above above seventy patients. Um, interestingly, yeah. uh, quick aside, I noticed that said they were all right-handed. Is how is yeah. that important? Like, uh, how would that affect results if you they were some people were left-handed or ambidextrous? So, uh, actually, handedness affects the laterality uh, of your brain, and so your the uh, the brain does is known to have the different circuits in the brain are known to have laterality. So. For example, and I know this might be getting to too nitty gritty, um, the salience network of the brain um, has a right-sided laterality, and that may be different in patients who are left-handed. So, what would laterality so, be? <laughs> Actually, so, I've never so, heard that word before. Um, so, uh, obviously, the, so the brain has a left and right side, right? And you right. have complementary. So, let's say you have a hippocampus on the left side, you have a hippocampus on the right side. Mm -hmm. Now, the way um, the different brain uh, the brain structures within a network are connected may not be, may be equal on both sides of the brain. They actually may be leaning towards one side of the brain, mm -hmm. maybe stronger on one side of the brain as opposed to the other side. Perfect. Yeah. So if someone's right-handed, they're going to have a preference for one side versus the left. Um, That's and, right, yeah. and since there are so few proportionally left-handed people, I assume it's just much easier to go for the right-handed patient That's selection. Right. Um, so yeah, sorry about that distraction. Just that caught me uh, or caught my interest as I was reading through, and I was wondering if there were any other reasons, like um, you you see pain correlations between one population or another, because uh, I know left-handed people supposedly, th and this could be a total myth. I might actually not. I don't have the data on this. I've heard left-handed people um, live shorter on average than their right-handed counterparts. <laughs> Although I cannot comment yeah, on that. <laughs> some of that might be as the world is made for right-handed people and so left-handed people yeah. have more accidents i'm not sure um, <laughs> anyways <laughs> we're getting far afield uh i did also notice that some of these patients were on various medications and i was wondering how you would kind of normalize for that um, especially if you're looking at this blood flow right and like some of these medications are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um, NSAIDs um, a lot of people are on those and they are known to affect blood flow so um, when you're looking at the data, do you know which patients are on these drugs or first you perhaps maybe do it undercover? 
Yeah, so that's a very good question. And in fact, that's probably, I would say, one of the biggest limitations to my study and a lot of other studies that involve um, that involve uh, uh, patients in general, because mm-hmm. a lot of patients are on a number of different uh, medications that do, as you mentioned, affect blood flow. So that is definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, we did notice, however, that when we were contrasting patients that were on NSAIDs and be- with those that were not on NSAIDs but were on biologics or TNF alphas, mm-hmm. we found actually no differences oh, in cool. the low frequency oscillations. So that is telling us that um, the the differences we're seeing from healthy controls is not driven by one of these groups pre- or by or there's no treatment effect. Okay, yeah, that's very that's very reassuring then, um, mm-hmm. because these these two classes of drugs they're both kind of anti-inflammatory drugs, um, but I'm sure some of them they have different mechanisms. Exactly, that's they work correct, a little yeah. differently. So um, very neat, very neat. Uh, now, did you meet any of these patients? I know normally there's a lot of uh, patient. Uh, confidentiality, but sometimes patients do want to walk into the labs and kind of see um, the research that's being done. Did you contact with any of them? or I actually recruited and tested about half of this cohort personally. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I did. Very I neat. met about 35 of them. Very cool. And these were, um, sorry we didn't get to this, these were ankyl- ankylosing spondylitis patients. Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> yeah, it's actually pronounced yeah, that's okay. It's actually pronounced ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing. Okay. Um, it's a it's a form of arthritis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a it seems kind of, kind of a niche um, syndrome. Very much so. Yeah. yeah, very much so. I've heard but of it briefly about, before. Yeah, but not. Yeah. Sorry. The neat thing about studying this population um, of patients is that ankylosing spondylitis primarily affects younger males. So I would say males in about their twenties is when they get diagnosed. Mm-hmm. Now, not. I would say about three fourths of the population are are male. So there are there are some females as well, but it's predominantly male. And because they are on the younger spectrum, they they are younger. Uh, these patients are do not have many of the comorbidities that other chronic pain populations do. Mm. So uh, if you're studying older, uh, let's say neuropathic pain, right. a lot of the patients may have other comorbidities which makes it really challenging when looking at the brain um, and trying to isolate whether uh, what you're studying is really coming from their chronic pain or is it coming from other comorbidities such as, for instance, depression or anxiety. Right. No, that's a really good point. So you kind of went after this um, very early representation of chronic pain as a way of getting a cleaner signal, perhaps. Yeah, a much cleaner population, yeah. Mm. That's a really cool decision there. Um, Yeah, so... I guess we should really dive into how you actually analyze um, these brain regions. Now, you highlight a machine learning approach. Uh, can you walk us a little bit through of what machine learning is, uh, what it entails, and uh, then kind of how you constructed such an algorithm? So machine learning, um, as you mentioned, is an algorithm that we build that uses cross-validation to uh, test it's a hypothesis. Now, what I mean by cross-validation is that a lot of research within um, within brain imaging, we'll, we'll leave it within the realm of brain imaging, um, has been criticized um, for the following reasons. So if we see a correlation between, let's say, a brain activity in a certain region um, and some sort of behavioral measure, uh, people may wonder, well, does that correlation hold within all Within, within all patients of that, uh, within that chronic pain population. So obviously the study has 100 patients. Um, the correlation is found and holds within your, your cohort of 100 populations, but does it hold for the general public of, let's say, AS patients? So what cross-validation does is it takes this, let's say, cohort of 100 patients and divides it into 10 chunks, 10 chunks of 10 individuals. And what we do is that we, uh, we, we make an algorithm and the algorithm, uh, you test, the, the algorithm uses, uh, the first 90 patients or the first nine folds to construct what it will be using. So it'll be using that algorithm to then test it on the last remaining one chunk or the last 10 patients. And then it keeps doing that over and over again. 
And so then what you get at the end is a plot of the actual uh, the actual rating of a behavioral measure versus what the algorithm inferred. Now, if those two variables are, in fact, significantly correlated, you can state that the algorithm is doing a significant job at inferring whatever behavioral measure you're looking at mm -hmm. um, by whatever whatever brain data you're actually feeding into it. Okay. So, for example, in this case, you would um, look at the fMRI data, connect that to the chronic pain state of patients, and then, it, so, of course, run back and validate your, your algorithm and see, see how it did, essentially, right? So what's important to note here is that the algorithm is actually constructed on, let's say, nine-tenths of the data, and it's testing it on the one-tenth of the data. So it's actually mm -hmm. testing algorithm on these unseen patients, which then, which then uh, leads us to state that if a, if, a, if a statistically significant relationship is shown, that these results are, in fact, generalizable. Okay. Very cool. So that brings me to... Um, a big question is how do you validate the pain state of a patient? Is it? A, it must be mostly self-reported, but do you have any non-self-reported measurements? No. So uh, yeah, that's a great question. So we, I, I particularly uh, use only self-reported okay. uh, questionnaires and measures, um, and so we ask patients to rate their pain uh, right before we scan them, uh, the average pain of the day of. Uh, as well as the average pain over the past week, over the past month. But yeah, as you, st as you stated, it is mostly self-reported. Now, uh, Waylon mentioned an emoji scale for pain. Do you use something like that? It's no, basically we don't uh, like a happy face, sad face, yeah. That's right, that's right, yeah. No, we don't use anything of that nature. Okay. How, how do pain, like patients, is it like a 1 to 10 scale or? Yeah, so it actually depends and that's actually one I would say of of the issues in the field is that people use different scales. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you can use a, a common scale is zero to ten scale. So mm -hmm. zero being no pain, uh, ten being the worst pain imaginable. Uh, other other labs use a zero to one hundred scale. Um, same kind of same kind of deal. Um, then there's a visual analog scale. So as the name suggests, there's actually no, there's no really numbers assigned to it. It's more of an analog from two different, let's say, bars. Mm. And so one extreme end would be no pain. The other end would be the maximum pain. And the patient would move uh, the middle bar somewhere in between those two extremes mm. to rate how extreme their pain is. So yeah, there are a number of different ways of measuring subjective pain, but I personally never use an emoji scale. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering how, I, I'm sure everyone has kind of a different technique in, in most of these labs. Have you had a chance to um, talk to any clinicians, uh, people working in hospitals about this research? And um, if so, what have they said and what have they thought? Yeah, well, actually, the neat thing about working at or, or conducting research at the University of Toronto is that it is affiliated with a lot of the major hospitals within nice. the city. And I'm actually stationed at Toronto Western Hospital, so I do my research at a hospital. Mm. And um, what was really convenient about, about being in a hospital is that the rheumatology clinic that I recruit all these patients for is, is just on the first floor. Um, so I just take the elevator down, and as you mentioned, I did talk with these clinicians, um, and they actually provide uh, these patients for us. Um, and yes... We, we do a lot of cross collaboration and uh, they look they look over our work and they give us feedbacks they give us clinically relevant questions and opinions and how we should really how we should be approaching quite uh, approaching our scientific questions so yeah we definitely do um, a lot of cross collaborations with clinical uh, individuals very neat yeah it's great to have that perspective um, and also I think motivation of course you interface with patients uh, sounds like pretty often so I'm sure you get a, a decent amount of motivation from mm -hmm. that that's that's a great experience that, yeah. so how, how close do you think we are to being able to apply this kind of technique in hospitals um, and now I know it still needs an fMRI but that does mean that uh, a lot of perhaps chronic pain patients can be identified and diagnosed more effectively, right? Is that one of the major uh, appeals to this technique? 
Yeah, so I think it, and you can even go a little bit further than that. Um, now, of course, this kind of work is still, I would argue, in its infancy. Sure. But should we nail it down um, and we know exactly what these low frequency oscillations and how they are abnormal in chronic pain, I, the next logical move would be to apply some sort of stimulation, whether that be our TMS or DBS, um, to get these to get these brain oscillations or these low frequency fluctuations back into normal no, normal levels. Mm-hmm. So I know deep brain stimulation is, or, sorry, DBS is deep brain stimulation. You said RTMS or was it RCMS? Right, what? RTMS. So that uh, stands for stands for repetitive transcranial oh. magnetic stimulation. Okay, didn't know that that R part. Interesting, and that is uh, less invasive than deep brain stimulation for sure. So that's correct. People yeah. might know DBS, deep brain stimulation, from Parkinson's uh, patients. Actually, it's having a lot of success success in that field. Mm-hmm. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, I believe, has had some uh, promise in depression. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure. On that. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Right. So that's very exciting that you think that you could um, use these studies to perhaps intervene on the patient's behalf and, and have an alternative form of treatment. What is the standard of treatment for um, a chronic pain patient? Or I'm going to butcher this again. An- ankylosing oh. <laughs> um, uh, spondylitis. Yeah. So well, for chronic pain, for chronic pain in general, there's a whole host of treatments, uh, which include both pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. So um, pharmacological, as you've probably heard, um, opioids, mm-hmm. um, because of all the opioid crisis and all the, o- the attention opioids have received in the media. Um, non-pharmacological, and of, of course, there's obviously non-opioid pharmacological interventions as well. Right. Um, and then there's non-pharmacological interventions such as Cognitive behavioral therapy or uh, mindfulness meditation has actually been uh, really gaining a lot of interest and popularity hmm. as a non pharmacological alternative. There's also things such as uh, aqua therapy and just even exercise itself is actually recommended to a number of chronic pain individuals. Now, within for specifically for ankylosing spondylitis patients, um, majority of them are treated with NSAIDs. Um, if their pain is at a low level, and if it be, and if it rises to a moderate to more severe level, then they are put on these uh, TNF alpha biologic uh, biologics, um, and those are a little bit uh, those typically involve uh, biweekly or monthly injections mm. and have own um, obviously side effects, mm. but times they are very effective, and sometimes they are not. So um, sometimes you need a combination of therapies to treat uh, the chronic pain. And, you know, and then there's those select patients that do not respond to any of these medications and just have to bear their chronic pain and live with it and try to uh, find other ways to cope mm. or, or, or to continue on uh, with their daily function. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and again, I'll refer back to episode 30 where we discuss some of the things that might be common in, in chronic pain patients. And, um, and also there might be links between addiction and depression. And so we really don't understand how all of these are, are interplaying with each other, but it does seem like some people just for whatever reason can't respond properly to the, uh, the drugs that we're using to essentially band aid the problem in the first place. So it's understandable Absolutely. that it won't be a catch all and won't fix everyone's issues. Um, now with, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, um, it's a, uh, it's an arthritis of a specific joint in the lower back, right? So that to yes. me says it's, uh, it tied to inflammation and also, um, your anti anti TNF, it's an anti alarm signal for the immune system. If I were to really uh, break that down. That's not entirely accurate. TNF alpha does a lot more things um, than just right. that. But um, you're you're looking at toning down the inflammation in, in the body. Right. Totally, right. Right. Um, so do you know a lot about the like molecular uh, underpinnings of ankylosing spondyl- spondylitis or um, are you more um, uh, brain imaging? No, expert? more of the brain imaging. Yeah. So I do know a little bit that there is a genetic component to it. Okay. Um, and, uh, as you mentioned, it is the inflammation of the SI, so the sacroiliac joint, which is in the lower back. However, even though it, 
even though inflammation is primarily in the lower back, these a lot of these patients do have inflammations in other joints of their body as well. Okay, yeah. Uh, so they have so more of like a global pain as well. But in, in terms of the molecular, uh, a lot of the molecular details, I'm not too familiar with those. I, as, a, as you mentioned, I, I focus more on the brain. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's, I just find it super interesting. Um, as a kind of a, a niche disease, you don't hear a whole lot about. <laughs> uh, oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. But certainly in this case, you can learn a ton from it. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So what is um, an average day, an average week perhaps? Because I know sometimes day-to-day it can be very different in research. What is that like for you as a, as a student, as a researcher? And then also when you're well, done with work and school. <laughs> that's a good question. So I don't think I can even put together an average day because all the days are just so different. But hmm. um, one nice thing about our supervisor, Karen Davis, is she's very hands-off. So we know what we need to get done, and it doesn't matter when we get it done as long as we get it done. So we're not really confined to a 9-to-5 strict schedule. So we work at our... Uh, at our own discretion. Mm-hmm. So, um, and on the weekend sometimes, as you probably know. Yep. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, just, I, I mean, a lot of the time when I was working with these patients, I'm no longer recruiting data, so I'm no longer working with patients. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the time, we're very thankful for the patient's time. And we try to um, sort of, because I was grad students, I found myself a little bit more flexible mm-hmm. in terms of, in terms of time, that we try to sort of build our schedule around when the patients are available to come in, when they're available to undergo these scans, um, and when we're allowed to measure or measure their quanti- uh, their quanti- what we call a quantitative sensory testing. So we measure um, how they perceive different stimuli, and that all goes into our work. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think I really have a strict, strict schedule when it comes to lab work, um, but... I know, I know when I have deadlines, I just need to get my work done by a certain, by a certain date and I work, um, and, and, and I work at, at that. Now, outside of the lab, um, some things that I'm involved with, I, I like to stay active. So, uh, play a lot of sports, a lot of intramurals. Uh, I like going, being outdoors. I like hiking, things mm-hmm. of this, things of this nature. Actually, I don't know if you know Connor, but I'm also part of a science podcast at the University of Toronto. Oh, nice. So, yeah. <laughs> Please so, uh, send uh, us the link. We will post that and I would love to hear about it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, collaborate sometime in the future. Yeah. That'd be fun. What's the, yeah. is there a focus for it or is it more about um, research going on at the university? Yeah. So we try to showcase uh, a lot of the different, the breadth, I guess, of research at the University of Toronto uh, because the institution is massive and there's a lot yeah. of great people doing a, doing a lot of great work. And sometimes when we're in our lab and we're in our little bubble, we are a bit uh, ignorant of the work that's being done and just try to just, you know, cast a, a light on some of the different research that's going around in the institution. Uh, we created this uh, podcast, again, which is a fun platform, as you know, mm-hmm. to sort of engage scientists, um, trainees of different levels, and to just to get everyone out there and to be talking about science. Yeah, that's and awesome. We, and we, yeah, and we, we try to keep it fairly um, casual, and we we try to we try to have it applied to the late uh, the late audience as well. So we don't focus too much on the nitty gritty details of the science, but try to engage as much indiv- as many individuals from the community as possible. That's great. That's what we're about too. I think the more people that do this, the better, um, especially people who are entangled in the research and and um, in the trenches, if you will. Uh, cause it's very hard to pass knowledge, um, and, and all the nuance of science along by several steps. And so by the time it gets into a journalist's hands, by the time it gets, uh, to the public, things might be a, a little bit changed. And so, um, yeah, it can really, it can really alter the message and, and essentially what you can learn from things. Uh, yeah, I'd love to, um, hear more about it. Uh, we'll for sure be tossing that link in the show notes. Uh, now this is up and coming for, uh, straight from scientists, but, um, we are building kind of this network page of, uh, other podcasts, other blogs that are kind of similar to ours. 
um, people we've worked with in the past and plan to work with in the future. So that's going to be avail available very soon, at least in uh, uh, sort of a draft format. Um, so I might be in touch with you, Anton, about getting some of their media just so we can have like a sample picture and then maybe a few links to toss in that post. And that way we can, uh, you know, people who are interested in, in our stuff will probably be interested in yeah. yours as well. So, yeah, that sounds great. So uh, those who are listening, keep an eye out for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very cool. What uh, You mentioned a lot of intramural sports. Uh, what are your favorites? Mm -hmm. Definitely soccer. Okay, nice. Def playing a lot of soccer. Um, Is that football a little bit of basketball. in Canada? Do they call that football? No. No. Okay. That's no, just no, no, no. still soccer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. That's only in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit of basketball, a little nice. bit of volleyball. Uh, I play a little bit of hockey as well. Ice hockey in the wintertime. Mm, very good, yeah. Just something to you know, just a reason to get out of the lab, keep myself sane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> work life balance is important. And like you mentioned, yeah. I think the trust between uh, a PI, a principal investigator, our bosses essentially, and the students is really important. And I, I, I find the labs that seem to thrive the most are the ones where they you know, they don't feel like anyone's breathing down their neck and they feel mm -hmm. like they're they can be creative and flexible with their schedules, which sounds like with the patients is also a huge plus. Um, did you find yourself working with patients at weird hours or they generally wanted to come in uh normalish times? Uh yeah, for sure. Uh well rel relatively weird. I mean, I've been at the lab at seven in the morning on Saturdays, getting mm -hmm. equipment ready. Um I've been there up Till nine o'clock on weekdays mm -hmm. uh, but yeah so i mean it, it does fluctuate it does fluctuate but yeah it's definitely been late mm -hmm. late nights and early mornings and i know you said that your schedule is always changing which i totally understand we have these research cycles where you might be in a cycle now where you're like writing and analyzing data so i assume most of the time is at the computer um but That's maybe uh, and another time you're mostly with patients so um and maybe mm -hmm. If is there a split ever in the day or do you tend to block off the day? So like Monday, Tuesday, I'm with patients and then the rest of the week I'm writing up stuff. Yeah. So actually, uh, when I was testing patients, we were at the mercy of also the availability of the MRI. Right. Super so expensive. I, I was, <laughs> right. So I was typically spending two days a week. Um, my Wednesdays and Saturdays with the patients all day. And the rest of the time I was filling in, you know, doing, doing, um, paperwork or down in the clinic, recruiting the patients, um, testing the patients. Um, I, I also had courses at that time. Um, and then, then here and there, I would have to present my data. So I'd be working on a presentation or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot, a whole mix of, of things that, um, I'd be doing in the days in between uh, patient testing. Very cool. And um, so you wrote up this algorithm. I, I want to kind of get back into the science of it, if we will, because I realized I never really asked you uh, your perception of um, your takeaway for the studies, right? Um, we've been talking a lot about brainwaves. We've discussed like how we're arriving at these conclusions. And I think that's great to paint that picture for everyone. Um, but for the ultimate conclusion, um, I know you mentioned you noticed uh, abnormal low frequency oscillations as are in the <clears throat> in the title. Um, this is in contrast to uh, a fast oscillation, so faster brain waves. Um, and you claim that might be able to link to a pain type. Could you break that all down for us and then kind of give us your takeaways okay. for the thing? Sure. So one thing that I probably should specify is the reason why low uh, frequency oscillations are in the title is because fMRI it's one of the limitations of fMRI is that it has very slow temporal resolution. Mm -hmm. So we actually cannot measure more, um, many of these faster oscillations, which we can with uh, techniques such as EEG, for example. Right. So uh, a lot of this, a lot of similar work that does measure um, this sort of stuff, but on a faster temporal scale, would be using other uh, imaging modalities such as EEG or MEG. Mm. So because we're, we're using specifically fMRI, that's why we have uh, the word slow in there. Okay. Or low frequency. Right. Okay. Understandable. Um, and you, But you did observe some of these key differences in patients, and uh, you were able to highlight a few brain regions. Uh, according to the article, I saw the thalamus, which uh, I know as a major connective hub, um, and not much right. else about that. And then the yeah. uh, cingulate cortex, 
Um, but mm-hmm. I don't think you said anterior cingulate cortex, which I am normally familiar with in terms of kind of mm-hmm. reward uh, signaling. Um, mm-hmm. What is the, the region of the cingulate cortex that you are studying? Um, wh- what might that have to do with the results? Well, I, again, so we are, um, we're not studying per se a specific region. I'm we're sorry, more yeah. interested in the networks. Um, and as you mentioned, the mid cingulate cortex um, is part of the salience network, is what, mm-hmm. what is known as the salience network. So um, the fact that the mid cingulate cortex uh, has some sort of abnormal or aberrant fluctuations um, sort of points to the fact that there's some aberrant activity going on there. Now, within the realm of, of pain, we know that the, um, the mid cingulate is more involved in the affective aspect of pain, so not really the sensory discriminative part, which um, hmm, okay. uh, which would be uh, the which the thalamus or the primary somatic sensory cortex, for example, would be involved in. This is more the affective or aversive part of mm. chronic pain. So the fact that we're looking at all of these different networks um, and and we're seeing these abnormal fluctuations in different networks um, points that points to um, the idea that um, it's not only the, the perception or the touch uh, that these patients are experiencing as abnormal, but if they also have um, heightened, for uh, height, for example, uh, aversion or mm. uh, to, cr- to chronic pain. Okay, negative emotions and feelings. Emotions, exactly. Yeah. Negative, yeah. Yeah, we touched on in episode 30, we really um, went over that, you know, pain is such a subjective experience, right? I mean, everyone has a different pain threshold, and um, right. it's very hard to describe that to someone. And I think, you know, as we mentioned earlier, it's tough when everyone has different scales for it as well. So that doesn't uh, mm-hmm. help the situation. And so the subjective versus, um, I guess, the really innate, um, the word I'm searching for, like kind of a, a very base level of pain and then how that translates to the emotional response to that pain can be different mm-hmm. from person to person as well. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And so that's yes. Go ahead. So that's sorry. sort of something that we're we're trying to tap in, and um, and and that's the neat thing about do, using a technique such as fMRI, um, and specifically resting state, is that we don't necessarily need to look at one brain region mm-hmm. at a time. We can open it up to these brain networks and see how these brain networks are communicating uh, within and between each other. And then perhaps expand that to uh, other patient classes, I assume, right? Uh, is that the yeah. plan for the next uh, stages of research? Uh, well, for me, I'm actually, what my next project is looking at is not necessarily uh, expanding to other chronic pain population, although that is one of the options that I had considered. Now I'm actually looking at treatment effects. So uh, I'm actually using a different chronic pain population, uh, neuropathic pain. Okay. Uh, so a cohort of patients with neuropathic pain who have undergone ketamine infusion treatment hmm. um, because ketamine infusion have shown to be effective in approximately 50% of patients. And that's exactly what we saw in our cohort. Wow. Um, and now we're looking at, uh, we're, 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 we're looking at and trying to understand why do some patients respond and one, why do some patients not respond? Mm-hmm. Again, we're taking the, we're taking the angle of, uh, these brain, uh, brain activity and brain systems as to why, um, we're, we're thinking that the, the reason why some patients respond and why some patients don't respond is the way their brains are wired. And we're mm-hmm. trying to tap into that. That's fascinating. Very exciting stuff. So I know you said um, you're a rising fifth year, right? Um, mm-hmm. Now that seems like you're pretty close to graduation. Do you have plans uh, for after that? Uh, what's next in your life, Anton? Yeah, so my goal is to pursue medical school after this um, with the ultimate my well, my ultimate goal is to incorporate research into clinical practice and become mm-hmm. a physician scientist. So after I'm done my graduate degree, I'm hoping to uh, do uh, to go into medical school mm-hmm. and merge those two fields. Very neat, MD PhD. Um, I, I know it's it means yeah. you're going to be busy in both places, so <laughs> I, I can totally understand with that. Uh, but the the people who I meet, um, the doctors who are you know MD PhDs, seem 
very interested in their work and very excited to be there. So definitely mm -hmm. glad that there's people like you going for that track because I know it is demanding for sure. Yeah. Do you want to stay in uh, Canada? Want to stay in Toronto for your uh, your next shot at school, or are you going to go somewhere else? Uh, not necessarily. Honestly, I'm, in fact, I'm actually pretty open to moving out, out of Toronto. I grew up here. I went to, to high school here. I'm done my grad school here. Um, I'm actually fairly excited and, and actually open to going moving to other other places in Canada potentially the U.S. as well in the future, but I haven't really put too much thought into that, but um, definitely getting out of Toronto for sure, yeah. <laughs> Had enough uh, of just one spot. Yeah, I get that feeling sometimes too, but um, okay. yeah, it's fun to move around. So I, I, anecdotally, I heard uh, Toronto was like a pretty good place for tech startups. I don't know if you've seen anything around about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't know much about that, but that's what I've heard as well. Yeah, sure, think there's, think there's, there's a lot of fun to, funding going on here yeah yeah very yeah. neat and maybe some of these uh machine learning concepts can be picked up by some of those firms uh, oh definitely yeah and i think that's that's going on right now not mm -hmm. even within the realm of science but yeah within oh, okay. business for sure yeah oh yeah you name it yeah well google is doing <laughs> plenty of yeah. work on that at yeah, the moment that's right yeah well that's great um uh one last question which i love to ask people i have for you anton is how, if in any way, because it not necessarily happens, how has the research that you've done and all of your learning and experience changed the way you um, either act or just kind of think about life? Huh. That's a good question. Um, well, what I can't say is that coming out undergrad, I had this idealistic view of the medical field mm -hmm. or just medicine in general. It really put the doctors on the pedestal and as if they had all the answers to all diseases of the world Miracle now universe, um, yeah. right exactly now as i as in grad school as it became as i learned more about chronic pain and brain imaging um the more i learn and the more i become to appreciate this kind of work the more i know how much i don't know if mm -hmm. that kind of makes you know yep. so i mean don't get me wrong there has been a lot of great discoveries within science and in neuroscience specifically that's my interest but it's still i feel like there's a lot of room for growth mm -hmm. um in both fundamental knowledge and in improving clinical practice and patient care. And so that's why I really feel like this field, particularly neuroscience is very exciting to work in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. There's, yeah. And I mean, not only you, you learn so much about what you don't know and, and what you, where your gaps in knowledge are, but mm -hmm. in, just in general, the human race, in gen exactly, yeah, right. have some yeah. massive gaps in, in how we understand things. Like <laughs> at a basic okay. level, we still don't really understand the brain, especially memory. People are working mm -hmm. on it for sure, but um, really can't pin down exactly where that is stored. So yeah. fascinating. You got any uh, advice for rising students who perhaps want to go into neuroscience or just science in general? Um, honestly, you know what? Like, this may sound cliche, but just do something that you're passionate about, something that you really matters to you. Because as you, you and I both know, being grad students, research is really tough. Um, and the whole experience can be a bit daunting. So um, to really enjoy it, you really need to do something that really interests and compels you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just that being said, I mean, don't be scared to step out of your comfort zone, take on new experiences. Um, but really... Yeah, just really hang in there and because it will ebb and flow and you will have, it'll, it'll be fun and at times it'll be rough. Um, so just really do what you're passionate about, what really motivates you to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And uh, yeah, take your time to find that, I think, because not everyone's oh, going to sure, find yeah. that immediately. Um, but do yeah. put in the effort uh, up front to find it out, right? <laughs> you don't want to just hope it's going to come it's along. Marathon, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pace yourself for sure. Thanks so much for coming on, Anton. Uh, any other thoughts for the audience? Uh, any any closing remarks? Um, well, in the in the context of chronic pain, which is obviously my passion, my passion, mm -hmm. um, I think no matter how how much uh, no matter how wonderful of a question we ask as researchers, and as much as we get bogged down in the nitty gritty and try to you know understand everything. I think it's always important to take a step back and think about the big picture. Mm -hmm. And at least for me, it's uh, all about the patient. So never lose sight of the reason why you're doing that research. 
Um, and for me, it is to improve. Um, and I'm a huge advocate for patient-oriented research. So mm. for me, it's all about the patients. I love that. Yeah, I'm I'm looking to get more involved at the hospitals uh, myself, even though I'll, all of the work that I do is uh, based in animal models or cell models. Um, I think it really does help to interface with patients. And I found those moments in which I do uh, give me a lot of long lasting like motivation and energy to keep doing what I do. So um, very cool. Wise words indeed. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, we're going to toss all those materials, especially your your article in um, in the show notes for reference. And uh, Anton and I will be working on some sort of graphic representation in the future. Uh, so hopefully we can Definitely. help people visualize these things because even I'm having trouble. I mean, I know what fMRI looks like. Um, I know the machine what the machines look like, and and they're really really cool. These like spinning. Uh, well, as you get inserted into a tube and there's a spinning magnet that goes on inside. Have you ever been in an fMRI, by the way, before I let you go? I have. I have. Yeah. And I'll be honest, it's not the most pleasant experience. Yeah. <laughs> it's really loud and mm -hmm. it can get a bit claustrophobic in there. Yeah. Um, that's how I imagine it too. Yeah. Do you yeah. Uh, do you ever worry, now that I think of it, um, that is altering perhaps some people's response, like some people who might actually be claustrophobic? Do you have people oh, talk about that yeah. and they're kind of taken out of the equation? Well, um, we do actually, as part of our screening form, we do ask the patients uh, whether they have a history of claustrophobia mm. and whether they'd be comfortable so. um, in going into an MRI machine. Uh, that being said, even if they don't have a, a, a history of claustrophobia, they may still feel a little bit uncomfortable, especially when they're first uh, popped into the machine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that definitely could uh, affect a result. Um, how it does so, I, I don't say, I, I wouldn't say that there is, uh, we, at this, at this stage, we currently know. But um, yeah, that's definitely an interesting consideration and something that has been talked about in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine. I mean, of course, the larger your sample size gets, the more you can average out for right. that kind of thing. Um, right. so, uh, but yeah, right. it's something I thought, because I don't consider myself claustrophobic, but if I were to get in one of those things, I might oh, yeah. be a little bit concerned. And uh, I, I wonder if that might read out kind of like pain, uh, or at least an emotional response to pain might um, activate some of the same oh, networks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get your physiological rhythms going faster and get your blood flowing. So, yeah. For sure. <laughs> Giving me a lot mm -hmm. to think about. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thanks, Anton. Again, this has been great. Uh, maybe we can get you and Waylon together in a room sometime to really talk nerdy. Um, and then, yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, uh, uh, or a, a virtual room perhaps. Or, hey, if you're coming to UNC, we got a great medical school here. So um, for sure, hit me up. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming on, Anton. Thanks for listening all. <laughs>